So welcome everyone to uh, this this event, which we're really really pleased to welcome uh, Corporate Watch. Here, some of you will know Corporate Watch, maybe some of you, you will not. For my money, they are a remarkable organisation that has consistently uncovered issues around corporate power that nobody else has researched. I'm going to introduce the day just by saying, if, making a few comments about thinking about, almost before you start doing research, thinking about the kind of way that research questions are set up. Um, and I think one of the most important things to kind of recognise for all of us is, is the centrality of corporate propaganda in the worlds that we research when we're researching corporations. And I, and I, and I think I, I, I want to start off by saying that we need to think about corporate propaganda in, a really su in really subtle ways when we think about how research questions are framed. So, so I, you know, I don't mean in terms of, you know, I was in London yesterday, I was on the tube, and it was unbelievable, and almost every carriage I was on there's a poster here touting Heathrow's third run runway, and there's a poster here touting uh, Gatwick's second runway, and all the reasons why there should be a third runway and a second runway. And I don't, I kind of don't mean that level of, of, of corporate propaganda. I mean something that lies a bit deeper in the assumptions that we make about corporations and the assumptions that we, that then shapes the, 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 the questions that we ask. Um, and I, you know, I'm counting m myself more than anyone in this in, in the research that I do. I, I do research. Most of the research I've done around corporations is, is in, from a perspective of an academic criminologist who who studies corporate crime and asks questions about why um, the things that, that corporations do, which are much more harmful, and actually, in legal terms, very often much, you know, can be un, uh, um, equivocally described as, as, as crimes, why they're not punished or treated as such, and why we don't even think about them as crimes. So, look, I know not everyone here is an academic researcher, but academics will use the word ontological to, to describe the way in which we approach and think about um, uh, the way we construct our own understanding and knowledge about um, about about these things. So I, I take the, another word. Sorry, another another word to kind of throw in here is epistemology. That some of you might have come across again. The kind of construction of knowledge. That's the level we have to we have to think at. Epistemology just means the way in which knowledge is constructed. And I think that's where we have to have a kind of starting point. So I'm going to make some comments about that for the next half hour and then, we'll, and then we can have some discussion and, and, and questions. Um, I suppose the first kind of uh, point, I, I'm, I'm going to structure this, um, or I think we can structure the way that we approach pop, corporate propaganda in three ways. Um, so corporate research questions are, are always kind of sensitive, first of all, to what they mean for individual companies. So the kind of, the research questions, and I'm thinking if we, and I'm, I'm assuming that most people here are, are either researching corporations in some way or researching some aspect around private companies, <coughs> private companies and that's, that's why you're here. Um, but I, so I think the, the first thing to think about is, is what do research questions mean for individual companies? What do they mean, for example, in terms of their reputational damage? Um, what it means in terms of what the questions that we ask about how corporations organize particular um, activities, how, how organizations even do research themselves, right? So, so for a long time, I've done some research off and on around worker health and safety. And if you look at the, the research that's commissioned by companies themselves into, into worker health and safety, actually, particularly in recent years, it's been more and more about worker perceptions, not about the material conditions which lead to people being killed or injured at work, but the perceptions of whether they feel safe or not, right? Now, that is exactly what I mean in terms of the way that a corporate research agenda can, can set up particular questions and a particular almost a kind of epistemological way of looking at things because that's what constructs the knowledge. If you say, okay, well, you know, 50% of workers in this, on this oil rig feel unsafe, 
well, what does that mean? That means there's something wrong with the workers who feel unsafe, right? Mm -hmm. If you say the injury rates on this oil rig are 50% worse than, than on this, this oil rig, then, there's a, then you know there's a serious problem. So I know it's, it's fairly self-evident, but that's the first level I think we need to think about. What do research questions mean for individual companies um, in the way they, 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 we, we kind of approach knowledge? The second level I think we need to think about is what they mean for the corporate sector as a whole, right? Or for, for, for either for an industry as a whole or for, or for corporations as a, as, as a whole. Um, and, you know, I think if you think about the kind of the dominant, I don't know if any of you here from management studies or from, from um, business studies, but the dominant paradigm with which to understand the kind of negative things that corporations do, or the harms that corporations commit, is corporate social responsibility. It's dominant <coughs> in management studies and, and, and business studies. From my perspective, that's a problem. And, I th and, and, and for any of you who are looking at corporate social responsibility or dealing with corporate social responsibility, you'll know this. There's a big debate about, about whether corporate social responsibility is even an oxymoron or not, whether it makes sense as a phrase or not, actually. You know, whether corporations can ever be socially Responsible, whether corporations can ever be moral or, to, or, 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 or make particular decisions. I'm not going to get into that debate, right? But, but I do think that um, if you're engaging in, in research about the corporate sector and you're starting from a position where um, you're doing research that's looking at corporate social responsibility, you have to understand the kind of basic constraints that are on corporations which either prevents them or encourages them being um, being responsible. It's very difficult, actually, to talk about, in, 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 in to some extent, it's very difficult to talk about introducing, I'm coming from my own perspective here, recognizing my own perspective from a corporate crime perspective. Very often I argue for tougher penalties for corporations that, that harm the environment or that kill their workers. But from a a, social, a, a corporate social responsibility perspective, that doesn't really mean much because corporate social responsibility is about corporations taking on things themselves, right? And self-regulating and not being regulated externally by, by criminal law. So that's a, an example of how there could be two different approaches to research questions in, in, at that second level in terms of what research questions mean for the corporate sector. Um, thirdly, and I've kind of hinted at that in the last one, I think at the third level, the, the research questions um, around corporations are, are kind of sensitive to what they mean for policy, for how governments can and should regulate corporations, and that's actually going to be mainly what I'm going to talk about for the, for, for the remainder of, of my time. You know, how, what the relationship between governments and corporations should be, how government policy should be set up uh, in, in, in particular ways. There's an assumption and I'll talk about this in, in, in more detail, but I, and, and how it plays out, but there's an assumption which underpins policy at the moment in relation to private companies that pervades the coalition government, the Labour government and before it. Even if we look at kind of some of the alternative dis discussions in Scotland, and I would say this because, you know, I'm going to bring up the politics in Scotland, of course, are better than England, everyone knows that. We've been told that for the last few months, everyone knows that. Really. Except, you know, and I think it is, right, and I would say that, wouldn't I? But in one respect, it's probably not. And in that respect, it's in relation to that third question, set of research questions, the relationship between governments and, and corporations. There's a kind of assumption that the private interest is the same as the public interest, that if you enhance the opportunities for private companies, you enhance the opportunities for all of us. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to oversimplify things and say there's a yes or no answer to that kind of, kind of question. But there's an assumption, for example, that an independent Scotland should reduce corporation tax. You know, should be, you know, should not be, should be encouraging in business because the public interest is kind of equated with, with the private interest. And that's what I mean by a kind of ontological approach to understanding research questions that we ask about corporations, I think we have to step back from that a bit and say, well, wait, wait a minute. Sometimes the private interest is the private interest, right? And, and, and very often the private interest is not the public interest. And, and I think that's actually you know, fairly clear when we get to talk about that. 
that, that, that comes out. But then, bearing in mind that's my perspective, right? I'm, I, I am constructing the research interests that I've got coming from that perspective, right? We, none of us take a kind of, there are, there's no such thing as, a, as a, a neutral approach to conducting research, right? I think we can be objective, that's a different thing. I think we can be um, partisan and objective, as long as we recognize the position that we, that we come from. I'm, I'm more than happy, I'm not going to say any more than that, but I'm more than happy to get into that discussion um, a bit later on. Okay, what are those kind of, I'm going to give eight examples of, of kind of those epistemological assumptions that exist in the corporate world I think we need to kind of deconstruct and step back from before we start researching corporations. The first one, um, and I, I, I spent a lot, I actually spent a long time this morning thinking, should I bother with the first one actually? Because the, the, the first one is, is um, this kind of enduring myth of the trickle down effect. Some of you will have heard of the trickle down effect, some of you might not, but I'll explain what it is in a minute. The reason I was kind of humming and hawing about it is because it's nonsense actually. It's a very, it's a very established kind of assumption that we make about the way economies work and, and the way that the, the, the world works that's, that's kind of disseminated quite a lot by, by, by private companies. Two weeks ago, if anyone heard Joe Anderson, sorry, I, I wasn't, this isn't definitely not part of political broadcast, I'm not, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not a cheerleader for Joe Anderson, but I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing him just for kind of going on. He was on Radio 4 um, <coughs> on the Today program, I think about three weeks ago. And he actually, the, the question actually said, so this, they were talking about the new um, Peel Holdings Waterside development, the Canada Dock development, some of you might have come across. And the, the, the interviewer actually said to him, so this will have a trickle down effect, won't it? This will have a trickle. Peel Holdings are one of the most important private corporations in this, uh, in this area, controlling uh, most of the, much of the transport infrastructure. This will, this will uh, have a trickle down effect. Joe Anderson says, oh yes, trickle down effect, it will have a trickle down effect. <laughs> People will benefit from, from, uh, from the, the investment that will come into the city, right? Now, I don't know how many people realize this or know this. Yeah, I only know this because I did some research into it recently. The, the trickle down effect, the phrase the trickle down effect started as an American music hall joke. It was a guy called the Singing Cowboy or the Laughing Cowboy, I can't remember which, whose name was Will Rogers, who was an American vaudeville star in the 1930s who was responding to the Great Depression. And he, and he used to get up on stage and say, well, maybe if we, we have tax breaks for the rich, some of the money will come trickling down to the poor. And everyone used to laugh. <laughs> and that's the origin, that is the, the origins of the phrase. I mean, you know, I don't know absolutely if that's true, but I've read two histories which say that's the origins of the phrase. Trickle down effect. If you actually look at the, the, the data, particularly from, from this, there's very clear data from the states where, where this trickle down, trickle down policy, the idea that if you make conditions better for, for, for the rich, and particularly for corporations, then the money will trickle down and benefit everyone. The other kind of, uh, the, the other, the other um, phrase that's used to describe that is, um, is I, and I've forgotten it, Somebody has to help me here, um, but it's it's one that's become more common. Um, all boats rise to the top, or something. Like that. Um, the rising tide. The rising tide yeah. lifts all boats. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of similar. So once the trick things trickle down, then all all boats rise because people all benefit from them. They benefit those at the top. You know where that that has been taken seriously and maybe most seriously as a policy uh, statement in, in, in the U.S. that the evidence is. is very, very clear that this, this is nonsense, right? So the period in which, in which taxes on the rich and businesses were, were generally increased in the, in the US and in most Western democracies, but I'm talking about the US here, um, the post-war boom was a, was a period in, in, in which um, the, the wealth of the poorest increased, actually, in real terms by 40%. That was when taxes were on, on, on the rich and businesses were generally increased. The period for, following the 70s, when the Re Reagan government kind of started re-articulating this, this, this trickle-down effect, there's a period where, where the, the and, and if we look at from the 1980 to the present, 
the income of the poorest decreased by 40%. Right? That was the period when taxes were being were being reduced for, 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 for the rich. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I kind of, I don't need to, to, to articulate too much um, about about that. Very similar, we can see very similar effect in, in, in Britain, actually. Um, the top rate of income tax in the last 40 years has fallen from 75% to 40%, right? And in that period, corporation taxes, I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a minute, have, have also um, been part of this kind of, what I would call a race to the bottom. In 1980, the, the average wage of a, of a um, FTSE 100 senior executive and if you, sorry, if you take a ratio of the, the average FTSE 100 senior executive to the average worker, in 1980, the, the, the income uh, ratio was 18 to 1. It's now 162 to 1. And that's, and that's, the, that's the period where um, tax, as I've said, taxes have, 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 de have declined for, for the rich. So, what I'm saying here, really, is we, we step back from that assumption, which is never really, I mean, actually, there's, there's, there's um, a number of economists, but if you, if, you, if you search in economics, if you search in any academic economics citation list for articles about the trickle-down effect, you find very few. Uh, economists don't actually like using the term, it's very interesting, and very few neoliberal. I mean, there is a big debate about supply-side economics, which is what the trickle-down effect really is. Nobody articulates a simplified uh, uh, trickle-down effect. It's, it's very much alive and well in politics and in the business world, but it's interesting that even the right-wing economists don't, don't defend that, that kind of thesis. So, all I'm saying here in terms of that level of pro corporate propaganda, that, that, that means we have to start from a different kind of position when we ask some of the research questions that, 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 that we ask. Um, and capital flight is the same kind of myth. I mean, you might have heard various kind of terms applied to this idea of capital flight, but capital flight is a term that's used to apply to business migrating because the conditions are too tough in, in this country. And you hear you hear all the time, if you don't, you know, if you don't make things easier for us, if you don't uh, reduce tax, if wages are too high, then we'll just go to Indonesia or we'll go to Nigeria or we'll go to we'll, we'll, you know, somewhere in the world where we can exploit people better or you know, whatever, right? That idea of, 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 of capital flight. Capital flight does happen. Financial, I mean, we have to, I'm not going to get into this, we don't have the term, I'm not going to distinguish between, I think we have to distinguish between productive capital and financial capital. So capital, money that's invested in things that are being made into in real production and, and financial capital, which is just, is just uh, money leaving the country. We have to kind of distinguish between that. Um, but normally when capital flight yeah, it's kind of a mixture of both that, that, that tends, tends to be applied to. If you think about financial, actually productive capital flight doesn't happen as much as we think because companies like to invest where there are markets. They like to invest where there are skills. They like to invest where there is infrastructure. I mean, the oil industry, constantly, the British oil industry for years and years has, has been saying, we'll disinvest, we'll disinvest, we'll disinvest. We'll disinvest. They were never ever going to disinvest. I mean, there are various reasons why there's a downturn in the North Sea right now. But there's never really been a downturn, a serious downturn, because they know that the political infrastructure here is stable, they know there are skills here, and they know there's a communications and transport infrastructure, and they know they can sell the oil uh, into the European market. So anyway, capital flight also is largely, uh, if, if we had time I would talk about um, really what's happened in terms of the, and the evidence from the, from the, from the post-2008 um, crisis. But actually in Europe, if you look at where the, where the, the money flowed from, Spain, Italy, uh, Greece, they were flown from the, the, the countries that were, that were most in crisis, right? Capital flight stemmed from crisis. Now, the crisis conditions, from my perspective, and it's only my perspective, the research questions I ask are from this perspective, the crisis happened because we had not enough regulation. We didn't have enough controls on capital. We didn't have the kind of things that business say, well, if you do that to us, we'll go elsewhere. That was the, the origins of the crisis. Instability breeds the conditions of capital flight. <coughs> Under-regulation, not over-regulation. It's only my perspective. But it's actually 
a minority perspective, the dominant perspective still across Western democracies is, is that we should have relatively low capital, a bit more than 2008, but relatively low capital um, controls. Um, there's a really interesting case study of Malaysia, actually, that, that a lot of academics have written about after the Asian crisis in the mid-90s. The IMF demanded that, that all of the countries that were affected by that, by that um, crisis remove their capital controls. Malaysia was the only one that didn't. It was the quickest one to recover. So, I mean, you know, I'm not just talking about kind of, kind of approaching things from, um, from, from a perspective. Sometimes you also need a bit of evidence to also shape that, that perspective, and I think that's something we can talk a bit more about later. Oh, look, same thing about executive executive brain drain. So if, if, if business isn't going to go somewhere else, look, and by all of this, I'm not saying that business never leaves the country and never exploits conditions across the world. That does happen, but the picture is much more complex. That's all I'm saying. That, that, that's, we cannot allow those dominant assumptions to shape the, 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 the questions that, that, that we ask. And the same, the same goes for when we study executive pay, right? The argument is we have to have executive pay in this country because it's the market rate. But what does that mean? Well, it's always interpreted, well, we pay executives at the market rate because if they didn't, they go to other markets that where they would get the market rate. Well, where would they go? In this country, there's only one country that pays executives more. There's only one country that pays executives more, that's the US, right? So if they're going anywhere, they're going to go to the US. Um, one study, one, one very recent study that I read, 2013 high pay study, found that of 142 North American corporations that they looked at, not one, not one foreign CEO was, was hired from, a, from a, a business in another country, right? I'm not saying they, were, they, they had no foreign nationals as CEOs, but they weren't hired from other com companies in other countries. There was no brain executive brain drain in that sense. So when, if we talk about high pay or, or pay inequalities within companies, then we have to also start from a different standpoint that, that, that we're told about. Um, if you look at the world's largest companies, regardless of, of their nationality, actually, still so going beyond America, um, only about uh, one percent of CEOs in the world's largest companies come from other countries, right? So, if you, if you, you know, so we, you know, it's not just we're just talking about the, the, the U.S. Actually, more than eighty percent come through the ranks of their own companies, right? So they don't even move between companies very much. So that's that's something that we need to bear in mind if we're having that kind of discussion. Um, business is efficient. That's a, that's a very very kind of big claim that's always there. It's behind all of the privatization. Uh, schemes that we had, and it's, and it's behind all of the kind of other justifications for why corporations are central to, to, to our economy, this idea that business um, is efficient. From my perspective, it's not. From my perspective, business is not any more or less efficient than, um, than, the, private sector, than the public sector. I'm not defending the, the kind of old model of the public sector. Of course there were problems. And I think one of the failures probably of of politics in this country is a, is actually ironically given all of the kind of stuff around uh, uh, you know the, the way this phrase was used by the Blair government was, was was the failure to find a third way in relation to to public ownership or an alternative that wasn't just about monolithic bureaucratic public sector uh, institutions which by the way were in many ways a lot more efficient than the private sector counterparts or those uh, highly wasteful um, private counterparts, which incre increasingly, if you've read um, James Meek's book, Private Island, increasingly are, are owned by by Chinese or French companies in, in any case. Um, so we don't we don't have any kind of uh, any kind of control over how they run. Anyway, that's another, that's another that's a, a very different uh, discussion. If we think about efficiency, how, how if, you know that claim, and I'm sure some of you have come across it, you know that. In different, in very different forms, but just this idea that the <coughs> private sector is more efficient than the, than the than the public sector. Once we dissect that, actually, it's it's incredible. Just just in terms of the subsidies corporations get, a third of all research. And we're in a university here. A third of all research and development is used by corporations. 
is uh, subsidised by, is, is paid for by government, not subsidised, is paid for by government third, right? Now, something we never talk about, there's some people here who are postgraduate students, and not, not everyone is, some, some people are, I don't, I think there might be one or two undergraduate students, but people in this room who have paid, have paid fees, right? They've paid fees for their education. I was lucky enough not to pay fees for my education. The thing that's missing from the debate about, about fees in, in higher education is that fees constitute a massive subsidy to the private sector. When I was at school, I could have got a job in, as, a, as a bank clerk with a couple of O grades, the Scottish equivalent of O levels, right? And I'm sure that was the case across the country. To get the same job now, you need a degree. Now, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? But that constitutes a massive subsidy on the, on the private sector because they are getting highly trained individuals into those companies and they don't have to pay for the training themselves. So there are all kinds of hidden subsidies that we don't talk about. That once we start to unpick, uh, begin to, 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 to make business not look very efficient at all, UK train operators are almost completely dependent on government subsidies, we could talk about health, the care sector, pharmaceuticals, massively, um, private security, arms industry, wouldn't exist, wouldn't exist unless government were providing an infrastructure and, and providing subsidies. Um, there's a guy um, who's done a study, um, I'm wanting to say Kevin Williams, I've forgotten his second name, but he uses the term corporate welfare, which is used quite a lot in the States. Um, and Oh, this is terrible. This is, this is like an academic nightmare. You, you, you have research that you're just trying to cite and you have to have it written down. Is it, is it, is it Kevin Farnsworth? It's, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> thank you. Save my bacon there. But Kevin, Kevin Farnsworth works out that corporate subsidies um, are worth about 85 billion a year in the UK, right? And he calls that corporate welfare. Um, and look, from the fracking, the discussion of fracking that we're going to hear, I mean, this doesn't even include externalities, what economists call externalities, the, the social costs, which have huge economic costs, that we don't even count in corporate balance sheets. So think about the risks of the industry we're going to talk about later, fracking. Any environmental damage, very little of it is actually paid for by corporations, right? We pick up the, 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 the bill as, as taxpayers. I mean, the Department of Health estimates that about 20,000 people a year die as a result of pollution in this country, right? So, and that's a very conservative estimate. Hundreds of thousands of people are made ill by pollution. So who picks up the medical bills for that? Well, we do, right? Corporations don't pick up the medical bills for that. So, anyway, I think you get the point. We could be here all day talking about business subsidies. Privatisation is the biggest. Uh, there are now... Um, a majority of local authorities are saying, in this country are saying, that they've either considered bringing public services that have been uh, privatised, outsourced, back in-house. They're really considering, oh, I've done it. A majority of local authorities. Um, the main reason, cited by 60% of those authorities, was the need to cut costs. <laughs> to bring those services back in to cut costs. So we know this is this is really uh, part of the part of the part of the story. We don't, we don't even need to get into the artificial inflation of shares in privatisation. Actually, the recent um, the recent post office inflation of shares is, is uh, was replicated in all in all privatisation. We pay we subsidise as, as taxpayers uh, the artificial inflation of those shares. Okay, I think we don't we don't need to kind of um, talk too much. Um, I'm going to try and, uh, we're on, we've lost count of the number of myths I've talked about. We're actually on myth six. <laughs> um, so just to recap, myth one was the trickle down effect, myth two was capital flight, myth three was the executive brain drain, myth four was the business is efficient generally, myth five was that was, was the privatisation is, is efficient. There's quite, I mean, there's quite a lot here to engage with, and I don't expect, I'm just going to, before I go on, I'm going to take a little kind of breather and say, I don't expect the research you're doing to be shaped by those big macro kind of problems. The only reason I wanted to, to raise those issues at this session is just as a way of thinking about how the dominant research questions that we ask are framed in, in, 
so so please don't kind of you know I know I'm talking about kind of structural level issues here, but please don't let that put you off. We are going to be talking in much more practical terms about um, about corporations. Um, so I mean, myth. The, the next myth I was going to talk about was was the idea that that of a share owning democracy, which is you know is fairly I think we know how kind of untenable that is. Um, but about 45% of the UK population now does own shares through our pension funds. We don't know. We don't know what shares we uh, we own. We don't. Most of us, some of us, might do. But you have to do a good bit of research. That um, Chris and Richard are going to talk us through to know exactly where our money might be uh, invested in. But we are actually. To some extent, you could say part of Thatcher, that's, that's what we are, if we are part of Thatcher's share-owning democracy. We're not the share-owning democracy that was supposed to be created by all of those privatizations. Actually, in 1963, long before all the privatizations, um, individuals owned about 54% of the shares in, in Britain. Now, individuals own just 11% of the shares. So when I say we own shares, Actually, we don't as individuals. We own them through our pension funds and through our, our, any other investments we might, we might be involved in. So any prospects, Vince Cable, I mean, one of the reasons this is important for me is that Vince Cable's, or the, or the coalition government's main strategy to develop corporate social responsibility after the, the, the um, constant um, exposés about um, Inflation of director's salary, particularly after 2008. I mean, the Daily Mail, I don't know if it still does, but for one, pay, one point, the Daily Mail had executive salaries on the front page for, for, for weeks. The government's response, I'm, only, I'm not saying that to kind of push the Daily Mail, I'm just saying that's an indication of, of how, um, I mean, how public opinion has shifted. When the Daily Mail is saying that there's a problem in the property sector, wow, the government has to respond. The government did respond. How did Cable respond? He responded by saying, well, we just enhance shareholder democracy. We enhance the voting rights and the voting powers of, of shareholders. It's how it's used. It's barely being used, those powers. That's, that's another story. But it's based upon a myth. In 1963, when individuals owned 54% of, of shares, insurance companies and pension funds owned less than 17%. Almost 50 years later, in 2012, insurance companies and pension funds own more than 77%. It doesn't matter what individual shareholders do at shareholders' meetings. So, why am I getting into this? Well, I think that knowing that means we ask very different questions about what we do to control companies and how we control companies. And shareholder democracy, uh, I, I would argue, um, there's evidence that we can come at this completely different direction from Vince Cable. <laughs> I didn't realise I was, it's not a difficult argument to win. I'm going to stand up here today and convince you to approach the world in a different way from Vince Cable, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a vote winner. The, 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 the seventh myth, which is kind of overbearing and I think cuts into a lot of, a lot of what I've said, is this idea that red tape um, is restricting business. Red tape strangles business. We hear it quite a lot. We hear it quite a lot in the more, the more popular phrase that Cameron used to use a lot. He hasn't used it. And since he since he, he he used it in a speech in his response to the 2011 riots, and that is health and safety has gone mad. I don't know if you remember that. But one, in one of his speeches, he actually used the phrase health and safety has gone mad, and, and then tried to link it into the general breakdown of virus of responsibility in society, which which shows that we riot and now health and safety has gone mad. Anyway, health and safety. <laughs> It's gone mad. It's, 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 a, it's a phrase that, that really captured the public imagination. You know, I think it's I think it's ridiculous actually, because I've studied worker safety and I've seen how actually this work this is one workplace amongst the majority of workplaces that, thanks to the coalition, will not be inspected by the health and safety exam, ever, unless something. The coalition have removed the routine investigation of the majority of workplaces in this country as part of their business friendly. Health and safety gone mad. Red tape is restricting business. Burdens on business policies, strategies. Actually, the UK has probably got um, 
I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm citing uh, an OECD study, probably, according to the OECD, UK employment protections are amongst the weakest in the world. On one of the OECD rankings, only the US and Canada rank lower than the UK. Amongst That's amongst OECD developed countries, right? Um, a different study by the OECD shows that we have the second lowest product market regulation in the world. That means, that means protections for consumers. You know, and in a country where we shouldn't be, I don't think we should be too lackadaisical about this, in a country where we get sold horse meat in, in our burgers, we do need, uh, we do need that, 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 kind of, that kind of regulation. Okay. Um, I could talk for hours actually about the way in which, reg particular, in very micro, micro ways, particularly food regulation, actually there's very little, um, there's very little uh, food regulation now. The, the average cut since, since the austerity uh, cut started biting in 2009-2010, um, local authority training standards departments where food regulation and food standards are regulated have on average been cut by 40%. Right? So they've, they've experienced um, an even more intensified cuts. Uh, I, could, I could fire all kinds of evidence at you that shows you that health and safety is not gone mad, that we're not over-regulated and, 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 and so on. But just think about minimum wage. Minimum wage, huge debate in this country about minimum wage and about employer breaches of minimum wage and about low pay. Between 2010 and 2014, only two employers were prosecuted in across the whole UK for breaching the minimum wage. That's not red tape for strangling business. That's, that's a form of regulation that allows us to ask very, very, very different questions. Um, and I think, look, because we're, we're running out of time, I'm going to leave my thing, which is corporate social responsibility, partly because I've said something about that um, before. But I think also it, 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 it's good to, to leave some time for, for maybe questions um, or discussions. So I, I just want to maybe invite any any questions anyone's got of, about anything I've said, but also maybe any questions about generally how we approach research and how we kind of think about our research questions and the research questions um, that we want to ask. Because mainly what I've, I suppose what I've been doing is saying, well, this is the kind of dominant knowledge that we need to stand back from and in a way reject before we start asking research questions. And we've not really got to that, that kind of, kind of bit yet. So I'm inviting questions about questions.